All right, Titus chapter 1, and uh, we're going to finish off chapter 1 this morning. That's the plan. And, um, and verse 16 is the only ver- verse that we got left in chapter 1, um, and from the book of Titus there. And then we're going to take a break from Titus um, through December, and we'll start it up in the new year again, and we'll do some topical dis- uh, messages, etc., through the next few, in the next month. And so, but in Titus chapter 1, let's go read there from verse 10. This morning I have entitled the message... So, you know God. You know, you speak to somebody and you say, So, you know God. Tell me about Him. What do you know about Him? And um, so in Titus chapter 1, let's go read there from verse 10. For for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not to for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Verse 16, They profess that they know God, But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So this, the the scripture here, Titus has got to set things in order in Crete. There's some things that are wanting, there are things that are unfinished, there's things that he needs to set in order. He needs to ordain elders to oversee the local ministry there. And... um, and then in, in part of that setting things in order is that he has to make sure that the elders he places in order is, is the right elders who can withstand these things that, like verse 14, not giving to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. The greatest, I said to you before, the greatest obstacle we have, in the, in the, one of the greatest obstacles we have in the church is people think that they're spiritual Israel and try to preach Israel's message to you and put you on the performance-based system and, and, and they give you the commandments of men and the traditions of men and that's how you must do it. And so we know that we're free from the commandments of men and traditions of men. We're standing in Christ. We, we, we have liberty in Christ and that's where we stand in and we have the doctrine, the truth of God's word that that, 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 that works in us effectually and produces in us that life that is not a good work that is reprobate, but it's good works that is acceptable. This is, it's good works that is not abandoned in sin. It's good works that is not lost to grace, but it's works that God has performed. And so when he's talking about these people, and I think he's especially, especially referring to the Jewish uh, Judaizers and those people that, 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 that bring the Jewish faith in, and the commandments of men in, is talking about those. He says in verse 16, they profess that they know God. They profess that they know God. And, and I made a statement, you have it on your notes as well, and it says the religious zealot's conduct is such that they have no real relationship with God. Let me say that again, okay? The religious zealot's conduct is in such such that they have no real relationship with God. A zealot is somebody that is engaged in pursuit of religion, in pursuit of God per se. They want to try and find God, and, 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 and you know, that's a zealot, you know. And, 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 and we need to be zealous of good works, but we should not be a zealot in that sense, okay. And so the religious zealots, they don't have a real relationship with God. Their faith is really feigned. It's, a, it's an appearance. It's something they say, they walk, and they put up an outward appearance that looks good and feels good. Now you say, well, we, we know that he's talking about those people out there, definitely not talking about us. But sometimes we put up, up an appearance too. We feign some stuff too at, from time to time. That happens too. And now Paul says in, to Timothy, when he said things in order in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, there's a lot of counterfeit and a counterfeit Christianity, if I can say that with those simple words, counterfeit Christianity, there's a lot of them out there. You know, and, um, and verse, verse 3 says, in First Timothy chapter 1, he says, As I besought thee to abide, st- to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So they need to teach no other doctrine. 
what, what, what doctrine is he talking about? The doctrine that he has given to Timothy and given to the church there, tell these folks not to teach anything else but what I've given you. Because if you're going to teach anything else that I've given you, you're going to have a faith that is hypocritical, a faith that's not real, it's going to be vain. Look at verse next verse. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, that's the Jewy stuff, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which in faith so do. Now, the end of commandment, what Paul said Timothy to do there, the end of the commandment, the result there is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. The faith that they're going to have is the real deal. It's unfeigned. It's not hypocritical. It's not a make-believe. It's not a counterfeit. It's the real deal. That's what the doctrine is going to bring you, a real deal. Go back to Titus chapter 1. He says, they profess that they know God. They make an open show and a declaration. I know God. Have you ever spoken to somebody that you try to minister to? And they say, well, I know God. Or, I know the Bible. I've read the Bible. And I'm like, you rascal, you never read the Bible. You maybe read some of the Bible, but you never read the Bible really through. You know? And so, and so they say, you know, I read the Bible. I know God. And my question is, do you know God? Do you know God? You know? And, and how do I know if I know God? You know? Look at what he says there. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable and disobedient and every good work reprobate. They profess to know God. And I want to say to you, if we're going to say that we know God, you know, then we need to acknowledge some things. Because if you don't acknowledge certain things, how can you say that you know God? If you don't believe God's word rightly divided, and you don't believe there's a distinction between prophecy and mystery, you don't, you don't know what God was doing with Israel, and you don't know what God is doing with the body of Christ today, you don't know the distinctions, and you don't know Paul's my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ during the revelation of the mystery, and you reject those things, you don't know that the rapture is going to precede the tribulation, I, I submit to you that you don't really know God. Because you don't know what you... If, if you say you know me, but you don't know what I have done, and you don't know what I'm doing, do you really know me? You know of me, but you don't know me. If you really know me, you know who I was and what, what I did before, and you know what I'm doing. Otherwise, you don't really know me. You've heard... You've maybe... If, if I was a guy that feigned the faith, you'll know that feigning, that performance I have, but that's all you know. You don't know my heart. Okay, and so with God, if you say you know God, well, you need to know what God is doing to know God. If you don't know what God is doing, or what God is doing today, how can you say you know God? You can't really know God then, right? And so, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul is writing, and, and um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37... In verse 37 it says, if any, uh, you guys have that? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be what? So what if you acknowledge? You've got to acknowledge what Paul is writing the commandments of the Lord. If you reject Paul's commandments... And you say, well, I just, I, I just believe Moses' commandments, or I believe Jesus' words only in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but I reject Paul as the apostle. I don't, I, I rather believe Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I rather believe the Old Testament prophets, and I rather just believe that, not what Paul is preaching. Guess what? You're ignorant, and, and, and you're not spiritual according to these verses. You've got to acknowledge. If you, so if you want to know God and say you know God, you've got to know what God is doing today. Otherwise you can't say you know God. You don't have that right to say so. Because you don't know what He's doing. Many people have a so-called zeal for God, just like Israel has. Go look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. The religious zealots. And Romans chapter 10. Verse 1, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. 
Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So guess what happens to Israel? They, are they saved or not? They're not. I want them to be saved. For I bear them record that they have a, have a zeal of God. But not according to what? They have a zeal of God. Do you know people that have a zeal for God? But not according to knowledge? That's not even Israelites. Oh, I believe in God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. But they don't know Him. Not according to knowledge. They don't know what He's doing. He knows what He's saying. He doesn't know His word. But not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So if you want to have a real zeal of God, you need to know God according to knowledge, and you need to submit to His righteousness and to His instruction and what He's given. Or else you can't really have the freedom to say, I know God. I mean, that's just basic arguments. Go with me to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. The book of Galatians chapter 4. Paul goes into Galatia. He preaches the gospel. He brings them into the faith. He brings them into what God is doing. He gives them the knowledge of God. He gives them the knowledge of what God is doing today. They get saved. They come into the faith. And guess what they do? They leave that. Look at chapter 8. Ah, chapter 4, Gen uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, so these people in Galatia were they idol worshipping Gentiles, right? They did not knew God. Even the, some of the Jews among them did not knew God really, not according to knowledge, right? After Paul showed up, he gave them some knowledge. How be it, when ye knew God, ye did by service, ye, ye, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Verse 9 now says, But now, after that ye have known God, how do they know God? By what Paul preached to them. He told them what God is doing. That's how they know God. You know God, or rather, are known of God. By the way, there's a lot of people that says, I know God, but you're not known of God. You don't have a relationship with Him. You're not, he's, he's not your father. You're not known of Him. But you, I know God. Do you? If you know God, you need to know what He's doing. You have to receive the knowledge. But now after that ye, that, that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements where are ye desiring again to be bondage? You know God, and you left that position from knowing God into turning to beggarly elements. Why would you do that? Your works then is not works of righteousness. Your works is empty. It's, 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 it's reprobate. It's lost. The problem with these people, the problem with people like that, religious zealots, like the Jews, and like many other people out in the world, is a heart issue. They don't have a new heart. They don't really seek after God. Look with me to Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29. Now, you know, I was thinking about this as I was speaking. It's like, man, that's going to sound very harsh to tell. How many, how many people do you know that, that, that are believers does not know right division? They say they're believers. They are believers. Sometimes they give the gospel to you and the gospel is true, but they, 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 the way they got saved is true, but they don't know right division. They don't know anything about what we are, but they say, I know God. But do you really? That sounds harsh, doesn't it? But isn't it true? Isaiah 29 and verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, Isaiah 29 verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near, with, near me with their mouth and with their lips to honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the what? Precept of men. So they come to church, they're out there, they'll, they'll, they'll praise God with their mouth, they'll worship Him with their lips, you know, with their lips they honor me, but they are removed their heart far from me. Why? Because they listen to the precepts of men. They, 
They bought into what they think they should do, what man is instructing them to do. When you start singing, you sing to God praises, and you better should put your hands up and wave them around, or else you're not very spiritual. You better, you know, put that money in the tithing box, because otherwise you don't know God. You know what I'm saying? They follow the precept of men. They just worshiping it with their lips and, 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 and with their mouth. They don't know God. Their heart they have removed. Because their heart, if you remove your heart, if you don't believe God, you believe what men tell you to do, and you believe what the, what the writers are writing, and you're not believing the truth of God's Word. Rightly divided. You can have an honest, sincere heart, but your heart is sincerely and honestly wrong. Because you cannot know God with that sincere heart. What you need to know God is according to what God has given you. Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48. And um, let's go read verse, just verse 1 there. It's talking about Israel. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob. Sorry, Isaiah 48. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of God of Israel, but not in truth, nor in what? Righteousness. That again, it's a seeking not God according to righteousness, not according to knowledge, according to Romans chapter 10. So they see, you know, they use the name of God, they use the name of the Lord, they make mention of God of Israel, but not in truth, not in righteousness. Do you know anybody today that speaks up <coughs> and, and names the name of God, names the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but not according to truth, not in, not in righteousness? That tells me you and I have a tremendous job at hand to try bring people to an understanding of the truth. Ezekiel 33, last one year in the Old Testament for now. Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. And verse 31. Ezekiel 33. Verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their, with their mouth they show much love, but with their heart, but their heart goeth after their what? Covetousness. Now I submit to you today that even believers today that are in Christ, that have eternal life, could have a heart that they follow after covetousness. We can, we can do that. Okay, we, we, and with our mouth we can show love, but our works doesn't represent what our mouth is speaking. Go back with me to Titus. In Titus chapter 1, 16, it says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, but in works they deny Him. Their conduct proves otherwise. Why would you think that would be? Why would somebody's conduct, in Titus 1, 16, and works, but in works they deny him, their conduct proves otherwise. They, they, what they say and how they live and what they do is contrary. It's the same thing with me. If I say to you, I love God, I know God, I know what God is doing, I know right, the word rightly divided, you know, and, 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 and I know what, it, you know what God is doing today, and I know who I am in Christ, and I know what the fruit of the Spirit is, and I know the tr word of God rightly divided, and it's effectually working in me. And I go to Gus, and I start cursing and swear, uh, Gus, and I beat him up, and, and just call him all types of names, and he's done nothing wrong. Is my works a representation of me knowing God? Is it contrary to what I'm saying? Now, I'm not going to beat him up. This, guy will, this boy will beat me up, okay? But I'm just using an illustration. Okay, I'm living in the imagination of my mind now, okay? Uh, but <coughs> I can beat him in mountain biking, but, you know. Not Robert anymore. Robert's the official champ now, okay? I can't keep up with him anymore. He's, he's killing me. 
okay? So if I get a heart attack or something soon, you guys know. <laughs> it's Robert, okay? <clears throat> Let's just hope I don't get a heart attack soon. <laughs> Go with me to First John, the book of First John. If we know God, then our work should not deny who, who He is and shouldn't deny what He's doing today if we say we know God. In, in, in 1 John chapter 2, oh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. We know He's writing to the believing remnant. He's writing to the children. Um, it's, because it's the believing remnant of the nation of Israel. This one says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The fact is, you know, even us today, we still sin, don't we? It doesn't mean we deny God. It doesn't mean we don't know God. We just, the flesh just, just gets the word of us, okay? I understand that. I, I'm not saying we, none of us is without, you know, does not sin. Verse 2 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world verse 3 and hereby we know that we know him if we keep his what what he's instructed us now sometimes we read commandments and we all the time you read the word commandment you see law you see moses but commandments is not always moses law it's the instructions but god Jesus Christ commanded the twelve to preach. What he's preaching, Paul has commandments of the Lord. He's not preaching the law. He's preaching the instruction of God. And then we know that, uh, and hereby we, we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. <clears throat> he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That makes sense, right? If you know God, you're going to do what? You're going to believe His Word, you're going to keep His instruction, obey it, and, are walking, and, 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 and trust it, and walk according to that. Right? You can read the, uh, verse 5. But whosoever keepeth His Word, in Him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby, we, hereby know we that we are in Him. You keep the Word. You believe the Word. You keep it in front of you. You walk, you walk according to the Word of God. In Titus 1, it says, They profess that they know God. <coughs> Excuse me. But in works, they deny Him. In works, they deny Him. <coughs> Excuse me. Go with me to Romans chapter 2. <coughs> Going back to the Israelites again, the Jews. In Romans chapter 2. <coughs> Let me take a sip of water here. The what? I, I'm, didn't, I'm didn't not hearing you. What did you say? No, we can't. <coughs> Romans chapter 2. I know you guys would rather listen to me than to him, okay? No, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them that are in darkness. Now, you know what the Bible says about the guide of the blind? That you blind leading the blind, you know? An instructor of, instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge. That word form there means they have the appearance of knowledge. It's all a profession, all a feigned thing. And you know, when I say when I say a feigned thing, okay, feigned is something that is counterfeited, right? A form of knowledge and the truth in the law, thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that says a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? And all these answers are yes, yes, yes. That's what they did. Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Yes, of course they did. Thou that makest thy boast in the law, break, uh, uh, th through breaking the law, dishonest thy God? Yes. Verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, etc., etc., etc. 
So Israel is this people. We know God. We know His law. We can instruct you what God says. We can instruct you His laws. And by the way, it's after the precepts of men, most of the things they do. We're going to tell you we know God. And what do you do? You dishonor as God. And what do you do? You, 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 what you do, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. The Gentiles look at you and say, these are the people of God, and this is how they behave, and this is what they do. And sometimes you and I, we say, oh, we know God. We know Paul. We know right division. We know God's Word, and we know all the details. But the name of God can be blasphemed by our behavior and how we walk. You know? And so we got to be careful about those things. And that's why we have to be in the Word. Again, it comes back to getting in the Word believing the word as the word of god works in us effectually it produces that life then christ is magnified i can't magnify christ in my life but christ is magnified in my life as i believe and trust the scriptures he is magnified in my life because it's the work of god in my life <clears throat> And so, this is the religious view. So works are important, you know. They, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Is works important? Does works... What is, what is, why, is, why would you think works are important? The what? We're saved unto good works. But why are we saved unto good works? Because when we do good works, it gives glory to who? to God. It brings honor to Him. It, it, it magnifies the name of God. That's what good works does. Right? And so if we don't have good works, guess what? We saved unto it in the way that good works is a result of good works. How does good work come about in your life? How do you have a good work in your life? Because you say, Jordan, I'm going to go out today and I'm going to do good works for the Lord and that good works is going to glorify God. Or is good works, Jordan, I'm going to go out, I'm going to believe what God's Word is saying, I'm going to trust it, I believe it, and it works in me effectually, God works in me effectually through His Word, and that produces the life of Christ in my life, and, 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 and the, the fruit of the Spirit of my life, and naturally the good works flow out. It's God's work. That man knows God. That guy that's cursing and swearing like a sailor, but he, he professed to know Christ, is he? Does he? And works is important. Paul goes, for, go back with me to Titus there. Ephesians 2, verse 10 says, For we are, uh, uh, two, who says, We are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto all good work, that we, that, which God has before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. In Titus, in Titus, he says, verse 16, But they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Verse 7 and chapter 2, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Verse 14, Who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of what? Good works. Verse chapter 3, verse 1, Magistrate, to be ready to every good work. Verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things will let that, let that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Verse 14, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Good works is fruitful. And for necessary uses. Good works are important. But in works they deny Him. How can your works go? Go with me to you're in Titus there. You're right in 2 Timothy. Turn one page back. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. What furnishes the man of God unto all good works? The Scripture that is given by inspiration of God. That's what furnishes us. So if you don't, your good works denies God, 
denies that you know God, that means the truth of Scripture is not working in you. You have not acknowledging the Scripture, and it's not working in you. If you're a pattern of reprobate works, the Scripture is not working in you. Titus chapter 1 verse 16, he says there, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Being abominable. That word abominable means detestable, offensive, unclean. Even it means idolatrous. Sometimes the believer today that's in Christ can have a form of idolatry can have a form of covetousness, which is idolatry. You know, the believer today that knows God's word rightly divided can have the idol of Paul. Paul is my idol. You know, we, we serve God through Jesus Christ. We've got our Father through Jesus Christ and by the Spirit working in us, not Paul. Paul was the instrument God used. I follow Christ. How? The way Paul was instructed and what he received and how he followed the Lord. But Paul is not my idol. You can get into the trap of idolatry. And if you're in that trap where you're not long-suffering with people, not forbearing, you're always beating them up because they say something wrong, your works really can deny the works of long-suffering, of forbearing, of kindness, and of tender-heartedness, of forgiveness. That's a work that will deny him if you're not that. Ooh, now we're getting closer to home, don't we? Being abominable. Job talks about how much more abominable is, is, is filthy, uh, and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. Take all the wrong in. Okay? They are disobedient. Titus 1, disobedient. They are abominable and disobedient. The disobedient means if you're disobedient, you're neglecting or refusing to obey. That's when you're disobedient. If I say to you and you're my child and Jordan's my child, I say, Jordan, I, don't want, I want you to stop doing this and I want you to go and do that. And you say, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ignore you. You're disobedient. When God says, thus saith the scripture, and God's word says, this is my instruction to you, this is what you need to do, and you don't do it, then you're disobedient. You don't obey. That's why Paul talks about obeying. We have a responsibility to obey. Not to be disobedient. Neglecting or refusing to obey. Doing what is prohibited. A lot of times we do things in the name of grace that is really prohibited. We've got to be careful. What we need to do is we need to obey. Look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Yes, Saul... He's the first so-called king of Israel. God puts for, gives Israel as a king. But God's desire was always for Israel to be their king. Right? And so they said, well, we want a king like the nations have a king. And God says, well, I'll be your king. And they're like, no, give us a king like the nations. That's what we want. Well, God says, I'm going to give you this king, but he's going to take from you and he's going to do all these various things. Oh, no, give him to him. We want him. We, we want to be like the nations. God gives them a king. First king there is Saul. And Saul messes up. <coughs> Saul doesn't do what God tells him to do. A couple of verses there, but you can read in your own time. Verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, You guys got 1 Samuel chapter 15, right? If you're in Kings, go one a few chapters back, a, a, few book, a, book, a couple of books back. Verse 10 says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. I've changed my mind about this. For he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. 
So what did, what did Saul not do? He didn't follow the commandments of the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and let's go verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord... Uh, 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 sorry, verse, tw verse 22 of chapter 15. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices. What did Israel like to do? Burnt offering and sacrifices. Does God have delight, as much delight, has God let, as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? What do you think God would prefer? You obeying His voice or the burnt sacrifices? Now does God have delight in burnt sacrifices and offerings? Yes but not as much as he has in you obeying his voice. Because when you obey his word, your burnt sacrifices and offerings and sacrifices will be according to what his word says, not according to the work of your flesh. You've got to obey. <coughs> you guys get that? <coughs> Verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than in fat rams. God says, I'm not interested in your offerings and your sacrifices if you don't obey. If you obey, yes, I am. But if you don't obey, I'm not interested in it. And that's what happens in performance-based acceptance Preaching is that you're going you're gonna to have to do things. You bring sacrifices. You give your tithing. You attend church. You dress a certain way. You do all these things. God says, I'm not interested in that as much as I'm interested in you believing and trusting what I'm saying. You should believe and trust. That, then your, whatever you do as a result of my word working in you, will be acceptable to me. It will be a result of you knowing me. Verse 23, for rebellion is at the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and thy words, because I feared the people, and obeyed their what? I listened to the people, I followed the precepts of men, etc., 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 and there's a lot of people in the church today, so-called people that has a performance like they are the real deal, but that performance is not according to obeying and, and believing and trusting in God's Word working in them. It's just a show in the flesh. And God's not interested in that. That good works will be like a filthy rag in His sight. Unacceptable. Reprobate. Doesn't mean anything. Go back with me. <coughs> to Titus. You guys following what I'm saying today? Many people come across... I mean, just, just recently we had somebody here that's telling us that they know God and, you know, and God speaks to them and tells them things and, 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 and all these various things. And, and, and I'm like, you don't even know right division. You don't know Paul from the twelve. You don't know this, the distinction between pro prophecy and mystery. And God speaks to you and you know God? How does that work? Your works is reprobate. Your works deny God because if your works matches the doctrine, yeah, I can trust it. But if your works don't match the doctrine, then it's not of God. And when you want to speak to a person and they say, well, I don't care what you think, this is what I believe. Okay. You follow your precepts, your philosophy, but it's contrary to what God's Word is saying. That is 1.16, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. You're lost to every good work when you do that. When you don't believe God, and, 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 and if you don't know God, you don't know what He's doing, your every good work you do is lost. It's like a filthy rag. Not interested in it. What happens is that they have the lack of God's knowledge, and the lack of knowledge and faith produces a reprobate mind. A lack of knowledge and faith produces a reprobate mind. 
And so that's why we need to have knowledge and we need to have faith, believing what God says. We have to do that. Just have a thought, just give me a second here. Almost done. What does faith do for us? Knowledge and faith. What does faith do for us? Well, I have faith, but what does that mean? When you say I have faith and I walk by faith, what you say in is, I make what God says, the divine facts, the divine knowledge, what God says, I make them real. I believe them, I trust them. And I become illuminated in my mind with conviction. And I act on conviction based on what I believe God says. That's what faith is. I trust Him. And that works, it's going to be a result of that. Knowledge has to be retained. What is, why did God give the nations up <clears throat> in Romans chapter 1? They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They were more interested in what does the church teach? You speak to somebody, you tell them about the right division, you tell them about God, what God is doing today, and they say, well, I don't know about that. I better go check with my pastor. So you're going to listen to the precept of man? You're going to listen to what man says rather than what the Bible teaches you? They don't like to retain God in their knowledge, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind, an unapproved mind, to to do things that are not convenient. Talks about 2 Timothy 3.8, As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these always resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, lost to grace, lost to what God is doing, vain, just a reprobate mind. They're corrupt. It's the heart matter again. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. That's what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 says, having a form of God, but denying the power of. That works by a form of God, but denying the power is a reprobate good work. It's a word that is just not worth anything. It's empty. It's vain. It's missing. They replace God with their philosophy and that's why we at this church always say whether we preach at 9.30 or 10.30 or Wednesday or whenever we preach believe the scriptures don't believe me don't trust me trust the word receive it with readiness of mind but go search the scriptures whether these things are so and as you believe God's word it and works ineffectually you won't have every good work reprobate you will have good works that is pleasing unto him because it's according to his knowledge according to what God is saying and what he's doing I made the statement before already the way to eternal life is blocked by the philosophy and tradition of religious corrupt men and women The way to eternal life is blocked by the philosophy and tradition of religious corrupt men and women. They can rob believers even of their hope as well. By their vain deceit, because they're not doing it according to knowledge, they're not doing it according to truth, they're teaching you philosophy. You speak to somebody and they they tell you about how can you be saved, it says you give your life to the Lord, that's all you need to do. You give your life to God why would God want your life? He gave His life for us. That's the man's philosophy. Just give your heart to the Lord and you become a Christian. What? No. Believe what God says. That He gave His Son and He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we can be made the righteousness of God in Him. God gave us the gift of eternal life. He gave us His Son's life so that we can have life and eternal life. The other thing is the philosophy of men. You give God your heart. Why would he be interested in your stinky heart? Because he tells you about the condition of heart is deceitful. Right? And it's wicked. Why would he want that? He gave him his, he gave us his heart, his son. Of 
Colossians chapter 1 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny being abominable and disobedient and every word good work reprobate. As Paul is getting to the is writing to the Corinthians in closing, go with me to First Corinthians chapter chapter nine. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter nine. And we need to take take some advice from Paul here. In First Corinthians chapter nine. Paul says, I don't want to be a reprobate. I don't want to be a castaway. I, by the way, the word reprobate, castaway, and unapproved, it's all the similar words. Verse 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. And they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. So fight I, not as one that beat you there. How do you run with certainty? And how do you, run, uh, how do you, you fight as not, be, just, not just beating the air? You have them in a real fight. What do you do? You've got to believe God's word. You believe the truth. You believe what God is doing. Then there's no uncertainty in that. But I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a what? He says, I keep under my body. Robert is talking about glorifying God in our bodies. I keep under my body. Who's I? My soul, my spirit, the new renewed man. He keeps under my body and brings it into subjection. The body has to be subject to me, to what Christ is doing in me, to my renewed mind. And bring it under subjection. That, that by any means, when I have preached to others, I shall, myself should be a castaway. What does Paul not want to do? He doesn't want to be unapproved. He wants to be approved. To do that, he has to bring his body under subjection. I cannot let my body determine how I feel and what I do. I've got to bring it into subjection. How do I do it? By the renewing of my mind. I, bring in my, I, I, I have a renewed spirit that God has given me. It's, it's been made alive. It's quickened. And it affects my soul, my person, and it affects my body how I act. And the work is not reprobate then. It's a good work. It's not a lost word. Work. It's a word that's acceptable to him. Because I'm following God's order. I'm following the form of sound words. Because Paul doesn't want to be unapproved. And that's why we study to show ourselves unto God a work when it needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Approved unto God means... You get into the scriptures. You come to understand the scriptures. You get to know it. You're approved unto God. You're not a castaway. You're not reprobate. Your good works is what God designed it to be. Because it's according to what God's word is saying. So you know God. Do you? You know, people tell me, Well, I've read the Bible. I know the Bible. I read it cover to cover. I know it. I just ask you one question or two questions and I know that you haven't you don't know it. Well, I know the mystery. Oh, well, tell me what the mystery is. No, you don't know. How can you say you know God? You don't even know what God is doing. Now, I'm not saying we should know everything that God does. Anybody here put your hand up? You know everything about God's word, every detail of it? No. But you know you know basically what God is doing in the sense of word of rightly dividing the distinctions right so you can know you can know god and we are you know we are known of him he knows us now but we need to believe the truth of what he's preaching what he's doing to say that i know god my wife knows me right would you say my wife knows me but there's some things that my wife's still learning about me from time to time right about a handsome eye. No, I mean, I mean, I mean <coughs> you know, we can know somebody, but we'll be learning new things from them all the time. I'm not saying you, because you don't do everything 100%, you don't know them. That's not what the scripture is saying here. He's talking about the religious zealots. They say, I know God, but their works is contrary to what God's word is doing. I used the example a little bit ago where these traditions of the Jews, they tell, you know, you, know, you say to, to, to your father um, and father, mother, um, ah, man, that's the word. It's a gift. 
Okay? And, and, and so, but you're following what the, the Pharisees and the, and the leaders of Israel is telling you, so you give, so you, that gets you out of taking care of your mother and father. He says, no, you don't believe my word. My word says take care of your father and mother, and you don't do that. Your words deny him. Even if you give it to the synagogue, even if you give it to the scribes and Pharisees, you are denying what God's word is saying. He's not interested in that sacrifice and that gift because it's contrary to what God's word is saying. You guys get that? So, I'm thankful that we can know God and that we are known of Him. And I pray that we continuously, myself first, and you all, that we will not forsake that, that we've known of Him, and give in to the works of the flesh. Follow the precepts of man and buy into that. But we'll hold the truth and in, in closing, Titus 1, 16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. But I speak, but speak thou the things which become what? Get into the sound doctrine. That's where we need to do. <clears throat> Get into the sound doctrine. And we're going to learn about what he's saying about that and how the church should operate, etc., etc. And we'll talk about that next time. Amen? Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we're thankful for your grace. We thank you for your word. We're thankful that our good works don't have to be reprobate. But as we believe you and believe your word and as obey your word and, and, and trust what you are saying, our good works is designed according to you effectually working in us that we can be perfect and truly furnished unto every good work which pleases you and honors you and brings glory to you. And that we will not mm. deny you, but we acknowledge you by what we trust and believe you are telling us and your word is saying to us and that how it works in us effectually. So we praise you that we can be this vessels of honor. We can be this vessels of honor as we give attention to the truth of your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And um, so we, we just praise you for everything that we have in your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, guys.